So today then we begin the final section of the course focusing on the Kantian deontological tradition in ethics, the main alternative competing tradition to the utilitarian one. I want to start by giving you a little biographical and historical background on Kant. Then we're going to distinguish and talk about in turn two aspects of Kant's view. First his view about the nature of morality, about what moral requirements are. Second his view about the content of morality, just what morality tells you to do. Begin though with that uh, biographical historical background. What I'll do here really is I'll draw on the useful little introduction to the Kant selection, pages 61 to 62 from The Right Thing to Do. And I'm, I'm just going to, you know, I'll add a few things as, as I read along. Okay. So in this little introduction, Rachel, I guess, says, Manuel Kant, who many regard as the greatest modern philosopher, led an uneventful life. He never travelled more than a few miles from Königsberg, East Prussia, where he was born in 1724. Königsberg is now called actually Kaliningrad. It's now um, it's now part of Russia, right? It, 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 it's it's one of those bits of Eastern Europe that, whose um, sovereignty has switched around. It was actually for a time during Kant's life it was under Russian control, and then the Prussians took it back over. Right? He was a professor in the local university, popular with students, and a much sought after dinner guest. He was also known for his regular habits. A bachelor, he arose each morning at 4 a.m., prepared his lectures, taught from 7 a.m. until noon, read until 4, took a walk, had dinner, and wrote until bedtime. He repeated this routine every day for years. Now, um, that's certainly part of the, you know, the standard picture of Kant, and clearly there's something to it. I mean, the standard story is that the housewives of Königsberg could set their clocks by Kant's daily walk, because it was always so predictable. Those who, um, like the recent Kant biographer Manfred Kuhn, want to sort of challenge this picture of Kant as hyper-routinated, you know, um, emphasize the fact that Kant lived a long life, especially for that era, right? He lived to be, what, 80, because he lived from 1724 to 1804. Um, and almost all the biographical information we have on him is based on um, biographies of him written at the time of his death, right? So they were written by people, by and large, who knew him as an old man. And people like Kuhn say, you know, lots of old people get very stuck in their ways and from the fact that this was the way he was when he was 60 you can't infer that that was the way he was when he was 25. Right? So, you know, such people say you've got to take this standard picture with a bit of a pinch of salt. Right? Reading from where we were, um, he repeated this routine for years. Yet despite his quiet habits, on the day he was buried in 1804, thousands of people followed his coffin down the street and the bells of all the churches tolled. Kant's unorthodox views on religion did cause some controversy. However, Kant was not an atheist. He was from a family of pietists who distrusted organized religion. In his later years, when he was rector of the university, it was his duty to lead the faculty procession to the university chapel for religious services. And he would, but upon reaching the chapel, he would stand aside and not enter. In 1786, having become the most famous philosopher in Germany, and having argued that God's existence cannot be proven, Kant was ordered to publish nothing more on the subject. Today, Kant scholarship is an academic specialty not unto itself. Many scholars spend their whole lives trying to understand what Kant wrote, and every year new books appear defending new interpretations of his philosophy. The multitude of interpretations is partly due to the richness of Kant's thought and the difficulty of the topics he discussed, but is also due to the fact that he was an exceedingly obscure writer. I, I, I basically agree with that remark, right? Um, the... Um, English philosopher C.D. Broad, who um, has a nice turn of phrase, says at one point of Kant that he contrived to be technical without being precise. And that, I think, gives one nice sense of what's problematic about his writing. Um, 
I'm not myself a huge camp th sympathizer, I should say. Again, um, you, you, I mean, there are things you can say about the difficulty of Kant's work and sort of explain why it came out like that, right? So Kant didn't hit on his mature system until pretty late in his life, right? Um, let's think. I mean, his, you know, the first central book of his mature critical period, The Critique of Pure Reason, came out in 1781, so he was what? Um, 57, right? He didn't know he'd live to be 80, right? So as, uh, you know, a German guy I met at a conference one time put it, I mean, you know, he was obviously in a hurry to get this stuff out, right? I mean, he, at that point he had this whole idea of this whole system, right? And he didn't know how long he'd have to articulate it. So um, perhaps uh, some of the issues with the writing are the reflection, in effect, of writing in haste. Um, I don't know. The other thing to be said about Kant's writing is, I mean, Kant's an enormously influential philosopher, not just for his writing, but not just by any means for his writing on ethics, right? I mean, his most famous book is The Critique of Pure Reason. That's a book in Metaphysics and Epistemology. It's about, it was standard pagination, 700 pages long exceedingly difficult, okay? So if you have the slightest inclination to self-pity for having to read four pages, a very short extract of his easy introductory book variously titled, you know, The Foundations or The Groundwork or whatever the print of the Metaphysics of Morals, you should instead feel profoundly grateful that you are not having to study large sections of the Critique of Pure Reason. Let's see. Uh, can't believe that morality can be summed up in one ultimate principle, the categorical imperative. According to the categorical imperative, to act morally is to act from motives that everyone everywhere could live by. Following selection is from Kant's foundations of the metaphysics of morals, the most accessible presentation of his ethical theory. I mean, it is the most accessible, right? It's, I mean, it, doctrinally, it doesn't share that much with Mill's utilitarianism, but they're both pretty short, right? So the, the groundwork is about the same length, it's sort of 50 pages in uh, standard um, pagination. And we've got just this very short extract, um, but this very short extract does give us a flavor of two, as I said, two key views of Kant's, right? This view about the nature of morality and his view about the content of morality. Kant, as we'll see, although we won't really explore why, takes those to be connected. Um, lots of other philosophers in effect disagree, because you'll find people who share his view about the nature of morality but not his view about the content and vice versa. So start with his view about the nature of morality. Um, this view, I mean in essence, as we'll see, it's the view that Moral requirements are requirements of reason. Okay. It's articulated, though, employing um, very famous terminology, a very famous distinction, the distinction between categorical and hypothetical imperatives. An imperative for Kant is something that expresses a requirement. Yeah? There's a there's a grammatical concept of an imperative, right? To be an imperative grammatically is to have the grammatical form of an order, right? You know, shut the door or whatever, right? Um, typically comes with an exclamation point afterwards. Yeah. Um, Kant's concept of an imperative is not the grammatical one, right? Um, for Kant, imperatives, as he uses the term, I mean, they can be expressed by what are grammatically orders, right? But they can also be expressed by statements to the effect that you ought to do something, you must do something, you're required to do something. So for Kant, what's key in the concept of an imperative is that it expresses a requirement and it need not have the, you know, the grammatical form of an order. So turn then to this famous distinction between categorical and hypothetical imperatives. Uh, 
Kant articulates it in two places, as you've seen, page uh, 62 of The Right Thing to Do. The first and fourth paragraph there, I'll, I'll, I'll read you both, I'll, I'll paraphrase the stuff from the fourth paragraph to try and bring out the contrast more clearly. Yeah? In the first paragraph he writes, All imperatives command either hypothetically or categorically. The former present the practical necessity of a possible action as a means to achieving something else which one desires, or which one may possibly desire. The categorical imperative will be one which presented an action as of itself objectively necessary, without regard to any other end. In the fourth paragraph, paraphrasing a bit, he says this. The hypothetical imperative, therefore, says only that the action is good to some purpose, possible or actual. Skipping a sentence and paraphrasing a bit, the categorical imperative declares the action to be of itself objectively necessary without making any reference to a purpose, i.e. without having any other end, and holds as an apodictical practical principle. What's going on here? Well, um, I think you could sort of start to get the idea. I'll, I'll, Rachel articulates it quite nicely in the Elements of Moral Philosophy. I'll turn to that in a sec. But look. Um, Basic idea is that there are these sort of two kinds of imperatives or requirements, right? One kind, the hypothetical ones, they sort of depend on prior desires or goals, right? And they tell you to do something as a means to um, satisfy that desire or achieve that goal. And they apply to you only if you have the desire or the goal, right? By contrast, the, the other class, the categorical imperatives, those are requirements that apply to you just in virtue of being a rational being that you can't escape by not having certain desires or not having certain goals. So here's Rachel's articulating this. So this is um, Elements of Moral Philosophy starting with the final paragraph on 127. He says, Kant observed that the word ought is often used non-morally. If you want to become a better chess player, you ought to study the games of Gary Kasparov. If you want to go to college, you ought to take the SAT. Much of our conduct is governed by such oughts. The pattern is this. We have a certain desire to become a better chess player, to go to college. We recognize that a certain course of action will help us, sorry, that because a certain course of action will help us to get what we want, studying Kasparov's games, taking the SAT, and so we follow the indicated plan. Kant called these hypothetical imperatives because they tell us what to do, provided that we have the relevant desires. A person who did not want to improve her chess would have no reason to study Kasparov's games. Someone who did not want to go to college would have no reason to take the SAT. Because the binding force of the ought depends on having the relevant desire, we can escape its force by letting go of the desire. Thus, I can avoid taking the SAT by deciding that I don't want to go to college. Moral obligations, by contrast, do not depend on having particular desires. The form of a moral obligation is not, if you want so and so, then you ought to do such and such. Instead, moral requirements are categorical. They have the form, you ought to do such and such, period. The moral rule is not, for example, that you ought to help people if you care about them, or if you want to be a good person. Instead, the rule is that you should help people no matter what your desires are. That is why moral requirements cannot be escaped simply by saying, but I don't care about that. Okay, um, let me now give you something explicit for your notes. Um, articulating this distinction so we can pop over to the PowerPoint.
Everyone got this down? Um, is everyone clear on this distinction? I mean, it's actually, once you get a hold of it, it's one of the more straightforward things in Kant. All right, so look. Um, armed with this distinction, right, you can spell out Kant's distinctive view about the nature of morality, right? That view about the nature of mor morality is the view that morality sort of consists of categorical imperatives, right? And that was that's sort of implicit in that passage from Rachel's. I just read you. Um, you can uh, break that view down into two components, and that actually gives you kind of a useful way of seeing Kant's view and also seeing alternatives to it. So if we could pop over to PowerPoint again, we'll, we'll, we'll do the breakdown and then we can reflect more on it. Um, so look, if, if we break Kant's view down this way, um, we can, uh, Kant's view about the nature of morality down this way, we can sort of usefully uh, place it against um, some competing views, right? Uh, so I mean, of course Kant believes both A and B. And, you know, a bunch of philosophers agree with him about that, including a bunch of philosophers who disagree with his view about the content of morality and disagree, therefore, that his view about the content of morality follows from his view about its nature. Yeah. <coughs> On the issue of the nature of morality, though, there are, there are these other alternatives sort of um, sketchable in terms of Kant's view, right? So, actually, one way to be a moral skeptic, and this really is... in a the way you get moral skepticism in the most famous actual um, articulation of that view by the um, 20th century Australian philosopher John Mackey. The way to get to moral skepticism is to agree with Kant about A, but disagree with him about B, right? So what the moral skeptic thinks is, yeah, Kant's right that, you know, our concept of morality is the concept of categorical imperative, so, you know, for there, for the, there really to be such a thing as morality, there would really have to be such a thing as genuine categorical imperatives. But then what Mackey tries to do is give you reasons to disbelieve that there are any genuine categorical imperatives, right? And that then is sort of the Mackeyan argument for thinking that really there's no such thing as morality as we ordinarily understand it. Yeah. Then, um, A third, you know, oh, broad range of views, uh, often non-skeptical views, actually, is held by people who, in one way or other, reject A, right? So, um, lots of people who are, oh, as they say, naturalists about morality think that um, 
you know, there is such a thing as moral truth, right? But they think it doesn't have to be understood in terms of this weird concept of a requirement of reason, right? I mean, that they 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 sort of share with the moral skeptic like Mackey the idea that there's something funny about this idea of an absolute requirement of reason, but they don't think you need to understand morality that way at all, right? They think you can understand morality um, without employing that concept, right? And so that, you know, it's just a mistake to think that uh, our ordinary concept of morality does involve the concept of a categorical imperative. So, as I say, I mean, sort of among the useful things about reflecting on Kant's view about the nature of morality is it gives you sort of a nice way to see the field, see sort of some of the range of views on this topic. Okay, so turn now then to Kant's view about the content of morality. Uh, As I indicated already, I mean, Kant thinks that it sort of follows from his view about morality's nature, which in effect lots of people disagree with, and I, you know, it's not, I don't think he has any good argument for it, and, and in any case we won't focus on that. Right? Um, it's also true that uh, his view about the content of morality gets put using the same terminology in, w in ways that can be confusing. Um, so let me try and forestall those confusions. You know, you, I mean, you never quite know whether you're doing this, whether, whether you end up forestalling confusions or introducing them, but you know, I'll do my best to forestall them. Right? Um, okay, so look. Um, First thing that can seem confusing is, that, is this. When you encounter the distinction between hypothetical and categorical imperatives, right, it sounds like, you know, there are a number of, you know, there's more than one possible hypothetical imperative and there's more than one possible categorical imperative, right? It sounds like you're naturally talking as if, you know, you can, they, they both sort of occur if they occur in the plural, right? Then, when you start talking about Kant's view about the content of morality, you suddenly start talking about the categorical imperative singular, as if there's only one of it, right? And that can be a little hard to get your head around because you just thought you encountered multiple ones of these and then suddenly there's only one of it, right? So you might ask, what's going on there? Um, the answer I suggest is this. Uh, Kant does think that there are... Um, in one sense, a whole bunch of categorical imperatives, plural, that is, you know, a whole bunch of, as it were, specific requirements of morality, right? When he talks about the categorical imperative in the singular, the idea there is he's referring to sort of the single test which determines or from which you can derive all these more specific requirements, right? So the categorical imperative singular, the single test, generates the more specific requirements, the categorical imperatives, plural. See. The other significant possible source of, well, confusion, perplexity, scholarly interest, whatever, right, um, about this is that Kant gives depending on how you count them, oh, uh, three, four, apparently distinct expressions or formulations of the categorical imperative, the single test, which he rather strikingly proclaims to be equivalent. Right? And so you've got this problem about understanding whether they really are equivalent and why he should think that they are. Now, by and large, we're going to avoid that problem because we're going to only focus on one of them, right? We're going to focus on the first that he gets to 
and the most famous of these formulations of the categorical imperative, the universal law formulation, right? Rachel's talks actually in, I mean, Rachel talks about the universal law stuff in chapter 9, and then he talks about the, um, the formula of humanity or the end in itself, another famous formulation in chapter 10, but we're, ju we're just going to make life easier by sticking to the chapter 9 stuff. All right, um, so, uh, wrong book. So to begin thinking about this, um, I need to start with what Kant says in articulating it. We can't end there because we've got to, you know, there's a bunch of work that you need to do to understand it that um, is not straightforwardly done by Kant himself, but you, you, know, you, you at least want to start with what he says. Right? So, um, he articulates the universal law formulation of the categorical imperative on 63 in the second paragraph, and then you get a slightly different version of it in the fourth paragraph. So, second paragraph. Page 63, right thing to do, he says. There is, therefore, only one categorical imperative. It is. Act only according to that maxim by which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. Then the, the slightly different version of the same formula, this isn't the end in itself or something, this is the same one, uh, is the end of the fourth paragraph. It's act as though the maxim of your action were by your will to become a universal law of nature. Let's see. So. Um, yeah, so I've, I've got a um, got a PowerPoint with these on. You, you probably best write them down. Everyone got that? Hmm? Okay. So, um, I mean, this is where you've got to start, right? You've got to start with what Kant says, but um, you need to do a bunch of work to understand what it means, right? So, um, in order to understand what it means, what you need to see is you need to 
see and understand are sort of the four key concepts that Kant employs in articulating it. And then you need to see how to put these four key concepts together to get the test, right? Um, so the four key concepts are the concepts of a maxim, of willing, of universalizing a maxim, and of contradiction in the will. I've got, I've got a PowerPoint here. Um, just sort of listing them, and then we'll, we'll work through them. So at least ten. So um, let's um, begin then with the concept of a maxim. So look, Kant's idea is um, whenever you act, that is, you know, whenever you um, do something voluntarily, not when sort of you know involuntary stuff beyond your control happens to you or happens in your body, right? But whenever you act, then you act on a maxim. And what the maxim does it, it, is it expresses, as you might say, the principle you act on, the reason you do what you do. Right? So um, consider what almost all of you, I take it, um, did prior to class today, right? You, you probably drove into campus. Right? So, uh, I mean, on Kant's view, there was when you were doing that, a maxim on which you acted. The maxim was probably something like, you know, whenever I need to get to campus and driving is the best and most convenient way, I will drive to campus. Right? For that to be your maxim, it didn't need to be true that that's what you were thinking about all the time you did it. I mean, you might well have been thinking about all kinds of other things. It might not have been sort of um, in your consciousness at all, right? But that it was your maxim would have come out, for instance, you know, if someone had like a police officer or someone that stopped you and asked you what you were doing, right? You know, and, and that, that was enough to make it true that it was your maxim, right? And Kant thinks really, you know, plausibly enough that um, whenever you're deliberately and voluntarily doing something, there is some maxim or other that you're acting on, okay? All right, so I've, I've got a, um, a PowerPoint to try and capture this, right?
All right, that's for now. Um, next concept then is that of willing, right? Um, so, uh, Kantian concept of willing, it's, um, mm, it's related to a, what I think is a familiar everyday concept that you also find in philosophy, but it's, 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 it's in a certain important way generalized, right? So, uh, this familiar concept that also has a, a philosophical guise is the, the idea, to wi the willing is sort of the, um, the, you know, direct precursor to doing something, right? So the idea is that the willing is sort of a thing that happens in your brain that starts the chain of events that, you know, results in bodily motion and action, right? It's the, the you know, the mental pre precursor to and cause of action, right? Um, the thing about understanding willing that way is that um, that means that you can really only will something that's within your power, right? That's the way in which Kant generalizes, right? So Kant talks, as we'll see, about willing things that are not in your power. So you've got to kind of generalize the concept so it's not just, you know, directly attempting to do something. It's you've got to say something about the case where you're not in a position to do that. So the thing I suggest saying is, is something about how you, it involves committing yourself to trying to do it if you can, right? So I think I have a... PowerPoint expressing that idea, yes. All right, turn now then to um, the third key concept, um, the concept involved in uh, universalizing a maxim or making it universal law. So here, I mean, the idea I think is actually pretty straightforward. It's, it, the idea is to convert a principle that just applies to you into a principle that instead applies to everybody. Um, if we pop over to the PowerPoint, we can sort of see how this would work, right? So, you know, start with a principle like this, right, which I suggest was many of your principle in, principles in coming in today, right? So, so, I mean, that's the individual version, right? And then universalize it and you get something like this, right? You see how that just involves taking something that initially just applies to you and making it something that applies to everyone.
All right. Um, the next concept then um, is a concept I think I can um, convey without. I don't think I have a PowerPoint definition of this one, but I don't think I need one either, really. Um, so this is the concept of contradiction in the will. Okay. So the idea here is that your will contradicts itself if you will something impossible. Right? How might that be? Well, try an example or two. Right? If you try to will that you simultaneously be stationary and jumping up and down, right? you will something impossible. Right? It's impossible to be simultaneously stationary and jumping up and down. If you try to will simultaneously that no one get help from others and that you get help from others, you will something impossible. Because right? it's impossible that it simultaneously be true that no one gets help from others and that you get help from others. Right? Yeah? So, in either of those cases, I mean, either of those, as it were, attempts to will something, you would will something impossible. Yeah? Alternately put, the other terminology that gets used here, your, your will would contradict itself. All right, so hopefully at this point then we're clear on these four concepts we need, right? So this concept of maxim, willing, universalizing a maxim, contradiction in the will, right? So then the final step in understanding how this test is supposed to work is to put them all together, right? So here's Kant's idea. His idea is when you're contemplating doing something and you want to see if it's morally okay, here's what you've got to do. You've got to figure out what your maxim was it would be. You ought to universalize it and try willing it. If you can succeed in willing the universalized maxim without your will contradicting itself, then the action you're contemplating will be okay. If, by contrast, when you try to will that your maxim be universalized, your will ends up contradicting itself, the action you're contemplating doing would be wrong. I've got a PowerPoint articulating that. We'll do the abstract version and then we're, you know, we're in need of an example, which we'll do next.
Okay, this time. I'll give you a... You got it? Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, we, we, I think we can go back to the other one. Um, so, having introduced this test, Kant famously gives you four examples which are designed to show how it's supposed to work. As we'll see in just a little while, um, those examples are more problematic than you might hope. It's, um, with respect to a number of them, it's not at all clear that they're good examples of the test in action. But still, you know, he gives you know, one or two examples which really are quite good at giving you a sense of how it's supposed to work and, you know, just to flesh it out a bit, flesh out how this abstract procedure that we've just characterized might really work in a practical case, we can certainly turn to one of them. So let's look at the second of the examples he talks about. So this is um, paragraph starting at the very bottom of 63 in the right thing to do, uh, following the numeral 2 there. Kant writes, Another man finds himself forced by need to borrow money. He well knows that he will not be able to repay it, but he also sees that nothing will be loaned him if he does not firmly promise to repay it at a certain time. He desires to make such a promise, but he has enough conscience to ask himself whether it is not improper and opposed to duty to relieve his distress in such a way. Now, assuming he does decide to do so, the maximum of his action would be as follows. When I believe myself to be in need of money, I will borrow money and promise to repay it, although I know I shall never do so. Now, this principle of self-love or of his own benefit may very well be compatible with his whole future welfare. But the question is whether it is right. He changes the pretension of self-love into a universal law and then puts the question, how would it be if my maxim became a universal law? He immediately sees that it could never hold as a universal law of nature and be consistent with itself. Rather, it must necessarily contradict itself. For the universality of a law which says that anyone who believes himself to be in need could promise what he pleased with the intention of not fulfilling it would make the promise itself and the end to be accomplished by it impossible. No one would believe what was promised to him, but would only laugh at any such assertion as vain pretense. So you see the idea here, right? The idea is, look, the maxim of this action, proposed action, is, you know, as Kant explicitly tells you, it's when I believe myself to be in need of money, I'll borrow money and promise to repay it, although I shall never do so, right? So, for Kant, that proposed action would be morally okay only if you could will this maxim as a universal law without your will contradicting itself. Right? So what you'd have to be able to will is a situation where everyone in need borrowed money on that kind of promise. But Kant says such a situation is impossible, right? I mean, if everyone tried doing that, if everyone tried borrowing money on these lying promises, no one would believe anyone, no one would lend money like that. So a situation, so it's impossible to imagine a situation in which everyone in, in that kind of need makes a lying promise to borrow money and gets money, right? So when you try to will that everyone act on the maxim you propose to act on, you end up willing something impossible, your will contradicts itself. So, for Kant, acting on that maxim would be wrong, right? That makes sense? You see, see, see the idea? See how it's supposed to work? All right. Well, um, next thing to do is to work systematically and critically, actually, through Kant's discussion of this four, these four examples, but let's take a break before we do that. <laughs>